Hello and welcome to the last chapter in our class, chapter 10. There's quite a bit of content in this chapter, so I am going to break it up into two lectures that are both about 15 minutes or so. So this chapter covers fixed and intangible assets, so long-term assets. So anything that's not a current asset is going to be included in this category. The big issue here is depreciation, how we spread the cost of those assets over time. And then I'll talk about valuation and a couple of different things related to that. And I'll end up with uh, some journal entries for how we exchange similar fixed assets, like if I trade a truck in on a new truck, which happens frequently. So we'll start with what are fixed assets. So these are long-term or relatively permanent assets. So I'm thinking about equipment in a factory, uh, machinery, forklifts, trucks, building, land, all of those things are fixed assets. They exist physically. You can see them and touch them and all of that. And the key thing is they're owned and used by the company in its normal operations. So. If we had, say, we've got a very important machine that we uh, have in our factory and our business depends on it, so we have a copy of that machine uh, stored in the back of the property in case the first machine breaks, that second machine is not a fixed asset. It's an investment because it's not being used in the operations of the company. And then they're not offered for sale as part of the normal operations of the company. So I might have a factory making picnic tables and I have a truck. Well, that's a fixed asset for me. The Ford dealership where I bought the truck has a truck. It's inventory for them. So it's not used in their normal operations. So if we expend some money, um, well, for, first let's talk about whether or not we capitalize an asset, which means put it on our balance sheet, or if we just expense it. So the key thing here is how long is it going to last? So if it's going to last a long time, then we're going to capitalize it. We're going to put it on our balance sheet. We're going to increase the asset account. If it's not long lived, then we're going to expense it. Say if it's um, some saw blades for a machine, those wear out fairly quickly or drill bits or things like that. We would just expense those things. Then if it is long lived, we would say, is it used in operations? If it isn't like say that backup machine I mentioned, that would be an investment. If it is used in normal operations, we'd call it a fixed asset. The other thing I would add to this diagram is if it's a very small value, uh, we would also expense it. So say as an example, I buy a hammer. Well, a hammer is going to last a long time, presumably, but it's a fairly low cost. So it's not worth tracking it as an investment, as a, as a piece of equipment and depreciating it and all that. So under normal circumstances, companies set a dollar amount below which they just expense it. So the cost of the fixed asset is all of the cost associated with getting that asset to your business ready to use in your company. So it's going to include what you paid for the fixed asset. It could also include inbound freight, if that's something you pay for, getting it from where you bought it from to your business, any sales taxes you have to pay or use taxes, uh, any repairs you have to make, if, say if it's a used uh, piece of equipment, you may have to fix it before it can be working. That may include parts and labor, by the way. Uh, any kind of modifications you have to make to the machine so that it can be used in your business or the building or whatever the case is. Uh, any testing you have to do, the cost of the materials that are uh, eaten up through testing or the labor that's involved in testing, all of those costs there could be used uh, or would, should be used to determine the total cost of the fixed asset. Now for expenditures after we purchase the asset, they fall into a couple categories. One is capital expenditures, the other is revenue expenditures. So a revenue expenditure is something that only impacts or benefits the current period. Let's say I um, give my truck an oil change. That, that doesn't cause the truck to last longer than it should have lasted to begin with because that's part of the deal. So that's just an expense for this year. Fairly small amounts usually too. Now capital expenditures fall into one of two categories. Either they improve the functionality of the asset. In that case, we would add it to the cost of the asset. Say I put a uh, snow plow on the front of my delivery truck. So now it has some new functionality. I can plow parking lots in, in addition to delivering products. That, that's an example of that. In that case, we raise the value of the asset and credit cash or a liability. 
The other type of capital expenditure is one that extends the useful life of the asset. Say we, instead of just changing the oil, say we have the engine completely rebuilt or we have the transmission rebuilt. Now that vehicle is going to last a lot longer than it was going to last originally. So if that's the case, we need to give ourselves room to keep depreciating it for longer. So we'll debit accumulated depreciation, which increases the book value of that asset, and it gives us room to depreciate it for now its extended life. So we credit accumulated depreciation and debit cash. Here's that same information just in a pictorial format. So this may make more sense to you than what we just talked about. So you can have this as a reference. Now, leased assets, that's where you're effectively renting an asset. So a lot of companies do this with copy machines, things like that, that they don't necessarily want to own for a long period of time. So a little bit of terminology, the lessor owns the asset and allows the lessee to use the asset. And the, right now, accounting standards are currently being revised. So we're going to consider all leases now to be short term with the expense being considered rent. Depreciation. Depreciation is the way we periodically record the cost of a fixed asset being, weared, being worn out over its life. So it's not an attempt to measure the value of the asset at any point. It's a way of allocating the cost. So it's a cost allocation system, not a valuation system. Now, assets become less useful for two reasons. One, they might physically depreciate. So if you have a truck, it may drive like brand new up to 100,000 miles, and then you start having problems. Once you get over three or 400,000 miles, it has a lot of problems. So things wear out. Also, things can wear out or become less useful because of functional depreciation. So maybe all of your salespeople have flip phones from the 1990s. Maybe they still work, but they're not functional anymore for people in the field. So those assets have lost their value, not because they physically wore out, but that they functionally wore out. So we're going to record the expense of that asset wearing out over a period of time. And that's what we'll call depreciation. So depreciation expense is based on three factors. What was the initial cost? And remember that includes everything to get it to your business ready to go. How long do we think we're going to use this asset? Okay. And then what is the residual or scrap value? How much will it be worth at the end of its life? So to determine the depreciation, we take the initial cost minus the scrap value. That's the depreciable cost. That's the drop in value over its life based on our estimates. I divide that depreciable cost by the number of years and that in the useful life. And that gives me depreciation expense each year. And there's a couple of different uh, and if you remember correctly, back uh, in chapter two or three, I think it was three, uh, we talked about accumulated depreciation. So when we record depreciation expense, we increase that contra account accumulated depreciation, and that serves as an offset to the value of the asset. There's a couple different methods that are used for determining the annual depreciation. Uh, the first and by far the most popular method uh, is straight line depreciation. So it's very simple math. You take the cost of the asset minus residual value divided by useful life. So in this case, $24,000 machine minus a $2,000 scrap value, divide that by five years, we would take depreciation in equal amounts, 4,400 per year. So the entry each year would be to debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation for 4,400. We would do that five years in a row. The next method uh, is an accelerated method. And well, let, let me first say one more thing about straight line. So some people do divide by the years, other people use percentages. So if we have five years, that would be each year would be one fifth, that equals to 20%. Uh, if our asset is eight years, we expect it to, to use it, and then it would be 12.5% would be the straight line percentage. So the next way to, I want to talk about is actually my favorite method. I'm enough of an accounting nerd to have a favorite depreciation method, uh, and that's the units of output. So rather than the denominator being a period of time, like how many years, it could be what we think we're going to get from this asset. It could be miles driven. It could be hours used. It could be parts produced, 
all of those different things. So now instead of dividing this, we take the same depreciable cost, cost minus residual value, but we divide it in this case by the number of hours that it's going to, we think the machine will run, 10,000 hours. And we get $2.20 per hour. So it, it perfectly matches the depreciation expense with how much the asset's being used. Imagine if you were a delivery driver for Amazon and you had a $50,000 van that you bought to be able to do that. If you think that van is going to last you 300,000 miles and you're going to uh, do deliveries for them about 100,000 miles a year, well, that would mean you'd take a third of the cost of that van each year in depreciation expense. Say one year you decide to take half the year off to double up on your classes in school, well, then you would take half the amount of depreciation that you're, you're using it half as much. So I think this is the perfect method, but um, not a lot of people use it, and they, and they should, I think. The last method I want to talk about, oh, and here's an example of that, sorry. The last method is a double declining balance. So this is if we have assets that are used extensively at the beginning of their life and then less so later. So we would take a declining periodic expense over the life of the asset. So we'd use this straight line percentage that I talked about a few slides ago, and we would double that. So if it was a five-year asset, that's 20% per year for five years, we would use a figure of 40%. And we would take 40% of the declining book value of that asset until we reached this residual value. So here's an example of that. We have a $24,000 asset. We don't worry about the residual value at the beginning. And this is a five-year asset, so 20% is a straight line amount. So we take 40% of 24,000. The first year we take 9,600 of depreciation. That reduces the book value to 14.4. Remember, book value is cost minus accumulated depreciation. So the next year the book value is 14.4. We multiply, or excuse me, it's uh, yeah, 14.4. So we multiply that by 40%, get 57.60. We keep doing that, and then we plug the final year so that we end up with a book value of 2,000 in this case, whatever the residual value is. So here's an, an overview of the different depreciation methods. Um, so you can see, and by the way, this is all specific to uh, accounting, financial accounting for financial statements. From a tax standpoint, the IRS has their own rules and own number of years and methods for doing depreciation. So this does not reflect what IRS depreciation would be. So last thing I want to talk about is revisions to estimates. So if we believe that an asset is going to maybe live longer than we thought or less than we thought, or we have a change of view about the, the scrap or residual value of the asset, we can make adjustments. So they were based on estimates. If we get better information, we can adjust those estimates. But we do that looking forward only. So we say, OK, how much book value is left in this asset? We now think it's going to last longer. Let's spread that book value over a longer period of time. We'll adjust our depreciation entry going forward. We don't open our financial statements up behind us and make adjustments to those. The last thing in this section I want to talk about is depletion, and that has to do with uh, owning natural resources. Maybe your family owns a timber stand, or maybe you work for a company that owns a coal mine or something. In that case, you would take the total cost of the resource, and that would be the cost of getting a road in, developing it, whatever is needed to get it ready to be used, and then whatever costs are associated with um, reclaiming the site, putting it back to its original uh, state, that sort of thing. Uh, all of the cost of the resource divided by the estimated units you'll pull out. So how many cubic feet of lumber will come out? How many tons of coal will come out? And then each year or each period, you keep track of how much you pulled out of that asset and you debit depletion expense and credit either accumulated depletion or the asset directly.